of the first thing you need to do uh, when you want to come up with a proposal for tickets. And I said today that I'm going to be explaining this equation. And I asked uh, who has seen this equation first. And I was really expecting to get a zero, like nobody saying, well, I never have seen it demonstrated. Uh, Ryan said you, that you've seen it, that you know what it is, which is pretty good, but it's way more than I thought. Uh, I only know of a one textbook that has it. Uh, and I can give it to you if you think is of interest for you. But it's really about understanding, well, if you want to know uh, something about your astrophysical object, uh, how many photons are you getting, what is the sensitivity you have, and what instrumental things you need to put to really get it right. Okay? So it's really an important equation, but I myself was never taught about it, not in a school or graduate school or anything. So I came up almost uh, to this equation by, because people were using it, but really never showed to me how to get to this equation until I found this one textbook. And that's what I'm going to be addressing here today. I think it's important that you know this because you are going to be using this instrument performance calculator. And what is built in for all of those instrument performance calculators is this equation, one way or another. I mean, there are a lot of details, as you'll see. So this is the cryonears IPC. This is the what? VVI or what? Is this, or was the old FIDO? I think that's probably the old FIDO, I believe. Uh, that's BBI, uh, IPC. And this one is the uh, VTF, IPC, that is the DLNERS, IPC, and the VISP, IPCs. All of them use one way or another this equation. And if you don't understand anything about this equation, they will be like black boxes to you. They're probably going to be always like kind of black boxes, but I think you need to know a little bit about what is behind. Okay, So that's what I'm trying to do. So to come up with the equation, uh, I need to get some definitions. It's some definitions about, uh, and Phil addressed this this morning, transport of photons. And I'll define what do, how do we quantify how photons are transported. Uh, and from there, I'll go to detecting the photons um, and what it means in terms of photon statistics. Then the complexity, the extra complexity added when you do polarimetry. And then I'll put a, an IPC, an instrument performance calculator that I made. So this is why I'm showing it here, because the other ones are black boxes to me. <laughs> so this one I made, the one for IMAX Sunrise. IMAX is an instrument that is like VTF. Uh, you'll see, but it's kind of equivalent to VTF, VTF type uh, of instrument. It flew in the balloon Sunrise. And the good thing of this IPC is that we tested it. Well, so the balloon flew, uh, flew already. And we know it's right, so that we get as many counts as we were expecting, and we got the signal to noise, and everything is kind of validated. Uh, I have a Excel file for this, and it's not Java, it's not ideal, but I think actually having an Excel will work better because you'll see the impacts of changing the size of the telescope, and you'll see how everything propagates. Okay, uh, and it is on the uh, Google Drive. Okay. So I need to come up with some definitions of propagation of photons. Well, who of you here have had a radiative transfer course or stellar atmospheres? So some people, some people. So it's like less than half. OK, so that's good, because then it still makes sense that I said what I want to say here, which is, I mean, there are two things that are intuitive. W one is that, well, you have a point source or a star, a star that is really far away. So it, it's going to emit energy. And just because it propagates over bigger and bigger distances, there is some energy per unit area that is going to go down because it's propagating the same amount of energy over bigger and bigger areas. This is a quantity that we call flux. Okay, In terms of uh, photon transport, is the radiative flux. Uh, and the star has a power. That's the luminosity of the star. So the units here are energy per second. So this is how my energy is emitted over the entire star. And then because the energy gets distributed over bigger and bigger areas, you distribute it over areas. This is the distance to the star. And the flux is L divided by 4 pr squared. So the flux goes down with the square of the distance to the source. That's this uh, famous inverse square law 
uh, for the energy. And you see that this is because we are distributing the energy over bigger and bigger, ever increasing amounts of surface. Um, and the units of this flux is somehow, well, it's the power times uh, area, okay? So that's intuitive that as you go away from the star, you'll get less and less energy density. But at the same time, another aspect that is intuitive, and uh, Phil said something about it, is that you are here and here, and you are going to just emit a photon that goes from here to here, and there's no absorption. And there's no emission, it's just one photon gets emitted, you detect it in here, and then along the ray, you are expecting to have constant energy. There is just a photon, gets emitted, and you measure it. So if you are just talking about one single ray, you would expect not to lose any energy, or like what in this concept. This concept is not a good one that follows this intuition that just a photon gets emitted. To capture this, what we use is the specific intensity in radiative transfer. This is trying to see how much energy you transfer in one ray. But one ray is an idealization. One ray will have zero energy. It's just one ray. It's zero. It doesn't have any measure of any, uh, of, of, of any area or anything. So by one ray, it's just you're not going to get any energy. So actually, to define the specific intensity, what we do in practice is come up with this definition that, again, Phil has said, but it's really important that we understand it here. Specific intensity is the proportionality constant when we want to understand the amount of energy that crosses a small area element, dA, that has a normal in this direction. And we're measuring energy that is propagating in a different direction. So there's an angle here. And we're measuring a pencil of rays. Again, one ray will always transmit zero energy. You need always a bunch of rays to make sure you have some energy being transmitted. right? Um, so the amount of energy crossing this area Per unit time, per unit frequency, so of course, it depends on the frequency of the photons, it depends on the interval of time that you're measuring, how much energy transfer this uh, unit area, and per d omega, that's the solid angle, that's this bunch of rays that you want to measure, because again, one ray will not give you any energy, you need a bunch of rays that, trans that are transferring this area and transferring the energy. So the intensity, the specific intensity, is the proportionality constant that you have in this equation is the amount of energy crossing the surface area dA over the time dt in the frequency range d nu over the set of rates included in the solid angle d omega. Of course, if d omega is zero, there is no energy. That's what I was saying, that just one ray won't do it. So you need a bunch of them, OK? And you can transfer energy. And you'll see that actually when you have this definition is good in the sense that from one point to the next, the intensity doesn't change if there is no absorption or emission. And I'll show that in the next slide. But it's important to be familiar with the units of intensity. It's ergs per second, that's power. Then for flux, we had the square centimeters. And here we're talking about a, diff a specific color. So it's by hertz frequency or wavelength, it could be. Uh, and by a stereo radian, okay? Because it's by this bunch of rays that you are transmitting in this cone over here. And actually, whether you use frequencies or wavelengths, uh, you need to use this equation. Uh, and that's the relation between, so I think you all know this. There's not much that I need to explain over here. But then in the slide before, so here is about an area, and here is just one single ray, right? So how do you go from intensities to fluxes? by just doing the integral on uh, the, the solid angle over here. Uh, and you do the integral, this quantity will go down with r squared, but the intensity, as I'll show in the next slide, will not. And the units of fluxes, in this case, because the intensity is by unit of frequency, here this flux is also by unit of frequency. There is this cosine theta here that I hope you understand that is needed, because we're talking about the energy to transfer the element of area. So your photon goes like that, at 90 degrees, there is no transfer. So that's why you need a cosine theta there, OK? So that's how a specific intensity is defined in radiative transfer. And that's the secret of the photon counting. There's one more aspect that we need to explain, and it comes in this slide, OK? Now we do have an emitter and a receiver. There is rays that are going to cross this element of area. And some of them will also cross this element of area. We're just going to look at those rays that are crossing both 
Okay, we're, they're gonna cross DA and DA prime. Uh, so we're gonna see how much energy transfers DA, and what is what we need to do? Um, well, we need to apply the equation that I just showed you. That's the definition. That's the amount of energy that will cross dA. But I'm saying one more thing. I want to see the rays that also cross dA prime, meaning that my cone now is the one subtended by dA prime as seen from here. It's all definitions, OK? Uh, there is no more strange physics going on. So the cone before here, it was undetermined how big it is. Now, because I want all the rays that cross here, also cross here, the d omega is determined by the subtended angle by this guy. So my the d omega is this one here, OK? Um, and then I could do, I can apply the definition, but now to this receiver over here. And I have dA prime. And to know how much energy transfer dA prime, I have to do the same definition, right? The same definition as before. But now is the energy that came from there. So the cone angle, d omega prime, is the one that this area substands as seen from this guy there. So meaning that d omega prime now comes from there. So there is no mistake here. There is no prime here, and there is a prime there on purpose. That's what we're saying, that we want all the rays that cross this one and cross this one. Okay? And this is the just by definition. Okay? So because all the rays cross this one and all these rays cross this other one is the same amount of energy, okay? There is energy conservation. I don't have emitters or receivers in here, so it should be the same amount of energy. So I can equate these two guys, put this definition in here, and then you get that the intensity, the specific intensity, I knew and I knew prime are the same. This is the radiative transfer equation, the simplest case. And actually, I think Phil had it. Phil had this equation. And of course, what I'm saying is zero, because there is no absorption, there is no emission. So this guy is constant. And that's what I just showed. That's the simplest solution of the radiative transfer equation. Okay? So the intensity, the specific intensity, defined in this manner, is constant along rays. Not rays, but bundles of rays, okay? d omega. Uh, so what is important here is the following. That's the sun. That's going to be a fraction of the sun. And who is this? This time I want you to answer. That's your telescope. That's your pixel, OK? So we're going to use this one, because that's where we are, OK? It's this equation. First thing that you do, in any telescope, if the rays are coming like this, you put your detector at 90 degrees, OK? So cosine theta prime is 1, OK? That's, that's just mechanical alignment. So you can get rid of this. And that's why I don't have it here, OK? Uh, this is amount of energy reaching here. What two things can you do to increase the amount of energy? Well, there are a number of things, of course, brighter. If the star, if the star is brighter, that will help. Longer time, more frequencies. But there are these two guys. What are they? Well, about this one, d omega prime, what we said is whatever you angle you subtend on the surface of the sun. So that's your pixel you project it to the sun, how many are seconds? That's what this guy is. And what is dA prime? Well, the bigger this one is, the more collecting photons, the more photons you will collect. So what is that? The primary mirror. OK, that's the primary mirror of your telescope. So this guy is the telescope. This guy is your pixel. The one pixel here that substands an angle on the sun. OK, so this is the equation we need to use to know how many photons we are getting on the detector. Did I go too fast? I see faces of people that understand what I'm saying, and others saying there is a trick here somewhere. It's actually all definitions, OK? So, uh, OK, well, that's the equation, OK? Let's, yeah. Can you repeat the pixel part? The pixel. So, uh, well, OK, I need to go here. So I have these two guys. And actually, the question is, who are they in practice, right? Uh, so here you have a collecting area. It's dA prime. And of course, the bigger it is, it's an area, uh, the more energy you'll get. And you understand that that's the primary mirror. So here, for the pixel, I'm saying, you are here. And you are saying, well, I need to substand an angle on the surface of your sun or, or your star or whatever, right? Uh, and that 
one a small tiny little thing in here that substands an angle on the sun. That's the pixel of your detector. So here is a point, and ideally, if you think about it, you would like your detectors made of points, an infinite of them, but of course, then they don't work. So your pixel has a finite size. Uh, but it's kind of the smallest thing you can think you can put in here, and you need to project it uh, to the sun and say, well, my pixels are that many r seconds a squared. Okay? So that goes into here. Okay? So how many photons are you receiving in your detector? The number of photons uh, that are reaching your detector, this is energy. Okay? This is the energy. And it's photons, so you divide by h nu, and you have the number of photons. And I was saying no emitter, no absorption. There is no emitter, but there is always absorption. Who is absorbing? Well, the atmosphere is going to absorb something, and the atmosphere that goes with the air mass, right, as the sun rises and all of that, so it's going to be changing unless you are in a space, and then you don't care about it. But then your optics is going to absorb. Every time you put a small mirror, a lens, anything you put will get some of your photons. So you have to account for some absorptions. And I'm folding this into tau. This one is just this one. And that's the equation on the number of photons reaching my detector. Then in practice, so dA prime, I say that's the telescope. So that's the area of the telescope. Uh, why like this? Well, P4 diameter square. That's how it's typically put in this textbook. So that's, so that's the diam diameter of your telescope. That's four meters square. Okay, and sometimes you have a secondary. So sometimes it's a primary and there's a secondary, and, the, and then you have to subtract the secondary. Good news for Dick is no secondary, so you don't need to have it. Okay, you need to put it. That's the telescope collecting area from the d a prime. D omega prime is the pixel of your detector projected on the sun, and typically this is either if it is an image, is the pixel square in our seconds. Okay, uh, so you have to uh, square this if it is a pixel, so that's for an imager. VVI or VTF is a pixel square, you project it on the surface of the sun, how many are, are seconds, and that's what you put in there. For a slit scanning instrument, you have pixels in one direction and the slit width in the other direction that you project. Okay, so that's why I sometimes have pixel phi, this is for an imager square, and phi, phi prime, that one is the slit width, okay? Yes. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, there is a secondary mirror, okay, but it's not all, it's not blocking your light, so you don't need to subtract, okay. That's one thing. Uh, and you're saying, why do the rays? Why do we need to assume? Uh, that's this, uh, which. Uh, the cosine tecta that I just said, is this what you're asking, no, the tecta prime? Uh, yes, they change a little bit, but believe me, it's just very, very small amount. So the, the amount of the angles that you have collecting in your telescopes, uh, they're tiny. It's, you can consider them to be zero plus minus a really small amount, okay? So it's really, really, it's a very good approximation to put a one here and forget about it, okay? Of course, if it was only one ray, uh, but then you don't have a sun, right? You have a point source. Uh, you have a, 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 a distributed source of light. You need to have angles, but these angles are really tiny. So you can consider this one, okay? Okay, now. So let me move on. So that's your pixel projected on the sky. Who is this? Well, your spectral bandwidth. That's, that's typically a spectral resolution. It's typically half the spectral resolution because you put two pixels, right, for your spectral resolution. But depending on the instrument, you might want to have a factor two or not here. The good thing about photon counting is if you are wrong, only by a factor two, you are pretty good. So actually, whether there is a factor two here or not, uh, sometimes it's, it's irrelevant. But yes, it's half the spectral resolution, what you need to put there uh, for typical instruments. Uh, and what is DT? What? Why do we have two pixels? Oh, that's the Shannon theorem. If you so, uh, in when you do a slit spectroscopy and you have this is the spectral direc direction. If your resolution is uh, that number, 
your pixels should be half of this to make sure you are sampling correctly the, the, this, this spectral resolution, okay? Um, with fabric pedals, it's different, but yeah. Uh, and wh who is this, this for your time? That's how long you are exposing, okay? So now you can, instead of having all of these relative transfer related definitions, you can put them there and you're getting closer to something you can use for, uh, okay, so it's, good. It'll come, I guess. So it's just block. Uh, wow. I? No, no. I had some coffee. Maybe it's the computer. Oh, look at this. Of course. Who said, of course? <laughs> okay, let me see. If it is my computer, yeah, it's the computer. Well, let me. Doesn't explode. So the my presentation is in the uh, Google Drive. Everything is there. Yeah, because my computer. Huh? Yes, that's what I'm saying, because I think my computer is actually dead. <laughs> so it doesn't do anything. Well, that's what I'm doing, right? <laughs> okay, stop it. We don't need to edit. Uh, it's coming back, but I'm actually uh, booting up, so it might take a second. Uh, well, you will have to download it too. You have it too? Okay, come here. Well, let me, I mean, maybe I have it back, my computer, so, well, yeah, it's there. So, well, I hope. Okay, there it is. So sorry about this. Um, so any problems with the small angle approximation? <laughs> I mean, no, no, I don't. I don't. I really don't. But actually, I had figures that I found uh, looking for this this receiver. Th that figure was very interesting that I found it because I. Uh, well, you know, I think is I know what the problem is. Is this guy? Is this the math? Wow. Oh. So you're gonna see now the real time show of everything that I'm. That's the Excel. That's my IPC, the one I promise, and I'll be running it in a second. Uh, so what is it? I don't need this. Well, there it is. Okay, so let's hope still it works. Uh, let me kill somebody. I mean, the problem is this math uh, editor for PowerPoint. Anyway, hopefully, so what I was saying is Okay, that, you know, I had this number of photons in terms of all of these relative transfer quantities. So we now can go to these and more practical aspects. And that's kind of close to the, the equation that I told you I, I was going to prove, right? So that's the equation. Uh, so it's this one over here. Doing these substitutions, you get this equation in here. Uh, things that n you need to do in practice. So these are the number of photons reaching the detector. But actually, detectors don't detect all the photons they reach, the pixels, because uh, they detect only a fraction. Uh, they are not as good as 100%, and we call this quantum efficiency. Uh, and that's an important parameter of detectors, Q. 
So you will only detect a fraction. Not only that, photons uh, don't come always in the same manner. They follow, they have a statistics, they come randomly following a Poisson statistics, meaning that you can repeat the same measurements, same atmosphere, same sun, same detector, same everything. You're not always going to get the same number. You'll get the same number with a variance. You'll get that number on average with this variance every time you repeat it, even if everything is the same. Just an intrinsic property of the photons and the Poisson statistics they follow. So there's this variance that is intrinsic, meaning that the signal to noise is these two, is Q, how many you've detected versus the square root. Uh, so you need to put the square root in here, meaning that that's the square root of this. So it's the square root of this guy with the quantum efficiency added in here, and that's the, intensi and the units of the intensity. So that's the equation, and that's getting closer to what I showed you. You would now solve for the diameter of the telescope, and you actually get something very similar. Here we have only the intensity. We, I don't have this uh, n 10 to the minus the magnitude, the brightness, magnitude of the sun that I was putting for nighttime astronomers. I have just the intensity. And that's the, what solar astronomers use. So you want to have here the intensity, OK? So that's the equation. I think I already proved it, but there are a few tricks here. Uh, well, several things. Uh, the quantum efficiency. Typically, you go to the vendor of the detector, and they'll tell you. It's one of the things that any vendor will tell you what is the quantum efficiency, and you'll see a couple of examples. So that's a, a known quantity for a detector. Uh, you have to be very careful with the units of your intensity. It can come through hertz or anstroms, or it can come with ergs or joules. Or, so you have to be a little careful when you take this guy, okay? understanding what units are they using. Uh, everybody knows this 206265, right? You all have seen what that is. That's the number of r seconds per radian. Okay? And that's what you need to use to project your pixel and know you have to put it in radians, not in r seconds. Typically, it's in r seconds. That's how you go to radians. You have to square that. That's how you do the right thing with this number over here. And actually, this equation is not entirely true. You typically have another source of noise, not only the intrinsic, given the number of photons, but also the readout noise. So you actually have to add them both. This is another property of the detector, how much readout noise in electrons. Actually, one thing that is interesting is that the units of this is photons. Qn is electrons. Okay, so that's Quantum efficiency is transferring from photons to electrons in the well of the detector. Okay? So these are uh, electrons and electrons, noise, uh, readout noise in electrons, and how many electrons you detect, you have to add them. But let's forget about this. We're using this equation. Okay? Uh, to what Phil said, it's not more mysterious than this. At the diffraction limit, the number of photons is independent of the aperture of the telescope. Well, that's built in into this equation. Because at the diffraction limit, your pixel is always lambda over 2D. You adjust it to diffraction. Some people put the 1.22 for the Rayleigh. I, I hate it. I never use it. Uh, the real cutoff is lambda over D. And then you need the factor 2 to make sure you are sampling correctly. Okay? So that's, you can put it if you like it. I don't. Uh, and it's not in my Excel. Uh, well, I think it is, actually, uh, in two places. I'll show it. But if you take this definition of the pixel, you put it here, d squared and d squared go away, and it doesn't matter how big your telescope is. The number of photons is always the same. So it's not more mysterious than this, OK? Sometimes, it, at least Christoph Keller was, would tell this in a way that it's kind of mysterious. It's not. It's just that. Uh, so how can you get more photons? Well, you can make the sun brighter. Good luck with that. Uh, you can, th this is important. You can put fewer optics, and that's important. You know, that's always a factor. I mean, just put nine mirrors, even if one mirror is 0.99, add the map, you, you get a price, right? So th this is one factor you can do. There's nothing you can do here, nothing much you can do here. Of course, you can have worse spectral resolution and bigger delta lambda, but that's bad for other things. And you can expose for longer. That's what we typically end up doing, expose for as long as we can to get more photons, right? So that's, that's what that is. So there's nothing more mysterious on this. That at the diffraction limit, you don't get, it doesn't matter what telescope you're using. It doesn't matter whether it's Dickies, whether it's Gregor. If you are at the diffraction limit, that's what you get. Uh, OK, so I said that uh, quantum efficiency is a property of the detectors. And I just pulled down from Google the visible one. And here you have uh, quantum efficiency for the visible. 
Uh, and there are two types of detectors, backside illuminated and frontside illuminated. That's really uh, if the uh, light hits first the photosensitive layer uh, and the coatings they have, actually it's better that it hits from the back than from the uh, front. So here the silicon is hit first, here the silicon is hit later, but first it goes through the right coating. So it has much better quantum efficiency. Typically 60%, 80%, uh, any quantum efficiency in the 60, 80% is pretty good. 80% is as bad as, as, it, as it gets. And 20% is, is actually pretty common. Um, and that's for the infrared. For the infrared, different technologies, uh, but it is the same concept. Given that many photons, how many electrons you get? Uh, and you get some of these numbers in here. I just put these two figures. Uh, Dickies will be using from here to five microns, meaning that you actually, the detectors change. This is in the visible is uh, silicon. Uh, here you have to go to mercury, cadmium, telluride, all of these uh, different uh, metals that you have in here. The intensity, and I said that's another thing. So that's the Q, well, over here. Uh, now let's go to the intensity of the sun. We're solar astronomers, we don't care about other stars. Well, the reference that I always use is this one. And there may be other newer, but that's the standard one, where you can go and really know how many thought uh, was the energy in watts, whatever, centimeters square, stereo radians, and strons. That's what this paper uses. And as I said, yeah, be careful with this. So this is this center, and this is the average sun, okay? Uh, and this is wavelength. So you have to go to your wavelength and say how many photons per uh, all of these units you get, how many uh, energy units. Uh, you have to be careful. The limb is darker than the, than the this center. A sunspot is intrinsically darker. And within the line, at the line core, you have fewer photons. So you're going to have fewer photons. So signal to noise. The less photons you have, the worse the lower the signal to noise, okay? So the signal to noise at the core of the line is gonna be worse. So with this caveat, that's what you have to do. If you don't wanna go to this reference, just use a black body. Uh, Phil just demonstrated that a black body is pretty good for just the verse. Um, I think all of the IPCs that we have at, uh, for, for Dickies are using black bodies, okay? At this temperature. Uh, and just you need to know the, equation, the units of your plan function, okay? What units are you using there? Okay, so that's about intensity, and that's how you have signal to noise depending on how many photons you do. Now, for polarimetry, it gets trickier, and some of this is going to be explained by Christian Beck later on, I believe. Uh, but I decided to put it without explaining the details because polarimetry complicates things further in the sense that you need to measure four quantities, four Stokes parameters. All of them have the units of intensity, so you, actually, they all come from combinations of intensities. So that's like the nominal way of doing polarimetry, textbook way of doing it. You do six measurements using a, a quarter wave retarder and using a linear polarizer at different angles. So you make these six measurements with kind of funny combination, S1. So you have to make six, six intensity measurements. Okay, and that's important because the more measurements you add, the better the signal to noise is gonna be, right? So how do you transfer or how do you include in your definition, the fact that you're making multiple intensity measurements into the benefits in this final signal to noise. That's what I'm explaining here. Okay, so you do six, uh, and then from these six, you get the four parameters. Don't do that, okay? Some people do it, but that's not the best way of measuring doing polarimetry. You uh, can do other things that are way better. That's just because this one, I think this is the one that is in the textbooks. That's how sometimes even the Stokes parameters are defined. And that's why I decided to put it, but it's not the most efficient way of doing it. In particular, you, for four parameters, you do six measurements, and you would wonder why, right? For four Stokes parameters, you can do just four intensity measurements, and you're faster. VTF, for four Stokes parameters, measures four intensities. All of the others actually measure eight, not six. It's even kind of worse. Why? Well, it's a rotating wave plate, has other benefits, and it's an honest story. Maybe Christian will explain it. But the thing is that to measure four Stokes parameter, you have to make a combination, several intensity measurements. And that number should be at least four, or it can be larger, okay? So you end up with a matrix. 
This is not a Mueller matrix. That's how you go from a Stokes parameters to your intensity measurements. So I don't have a Stokes vector over here. I'm assuming you know something about it. I'm going kind of fast. So this is what is called the modulation matrix. And I'm saying this because actually, you do the inverse of this matrix. It's not uh, four by four, but it does have an inverse, okay? It has an inverse in some sense. Uh, you do an inverse, uh, and then from the measurements, you get the Stokes parameters on the sand. And from this D, which is the D modulation matrix, you can define these quantities in here. N is what was six before. It can be four, it can be eight, depending on how many combinations you need to do. That's the N in here. And the D is parameters of your D modulation matrix, whatever that is. And that defines efficiencies, polarimetric efficiencies. I can be one, two, three, or four, meaning I, Q, U, or V. So you get an efficiency for each one of the those parameters. They have interesting properties. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're doing polarimetry right, all these efficiencies should be close to this number, and it's actually the maximum. They never get bigger than this uh, at the same time. So you know, don't need to understand this. What I'm saying is that, yeah, for polarimetry, you need to do multiple intensity measurements. And from these multiple intensity measurements, you can define these efficiencies of your polarimetric system. And then how do you change the signal to noise ratio? The equation, and I'm not demonstrating this, but I can give you a reference, is this one, okay? So this is the signal to noise ratio of one single image. That's the one that I just showed. That's the, the one we just, that I have demonstrated to you, okay? That's for one intensity measurement. But for polarimetry, you do many. Six, as I showed, well, here it would be six. And here you will have to put the efficiencies of the polarimetric system that you are using. And then you will do multiple numbers, what we call accumulations. And actually, I think every IPC for Dickies calls this in a different manner. Some so, some call coads. Coads. Uh, so I always use accumulations. And then you can go to the manuals for the IPC. And not everybody uses accumulation. That's, that's one of the things we should do, okay? Come up all with the same kind of language. Uh, uh, they call it coads, right? Coads is how many, as I said, you know, it's very hard to do polarimetry, right? Polarimetry, you know, the 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 I was talking. Uh, most of the time, one single image will not give you as much. How do you approach 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, doing many accumulations or coads? And that's the number you need to put here, how many you have to do to read your final signal to noise for each one of the Stokes parameters. Okay, okay so the I is one, two, three, four. So basically this is, uh, yeah, so uh, the signal to noise needs to be large, and that means you need to do accumulations, uh, but that means you are integrating for longer exposure times, and the sun is changing, the atmosphere is changing, so you don't, you don't want to do that, but you have to, you're forced, if you wanna reach uh, a given uh, signal to noise. So basically that's photon counting for polarimetry and photon counting for all of the eyepieces. Okay, that's what is behind. Uh, I haven't shown this formula, but in case someone wants to follow this, again, it's because of all of the math here that you need to put. I don't wanna make it too complicated. Okay, so I'm gonna show now these formulas, how they are implemented into an IPC, the one for IMAX. IMAX is the instrument that flew in sunrise. You have it here, it's all black because it needs to be black. Uh, you don't want straight light, uh, so that's why you always anodize all the instruments. So that's on purpose, that's the instrument I built for Sunrise. Here you have more or less what, is, uh, what the optical path was. And as I said, it's kind of a BTF type of an instrument. This is the magnetograph for solar orbiter. It's conceptually identical. It's even smaller uh, because you know, it's a space, so you have to do everything small. But it's the same concept. So there is some delta lambda coming from fabry perot There are liquid crystals. Uh, over here that do your polarimetry. You use liquid crystals, you can always use, use only four. N is four instead of six. Uh, and you have detectors, and you do dual beam polarimetry, all kinds of things. That's probably what uh, Christian is gonna explain. But that's the one that I'm gonna be showing uh, what the IPC is and how to use it, and you have it. This is data taken from IMAX. It is, it was taken on this Saturday, 10 years ago. Right? It was launched 10 years ago. This is still the best quiet sun data we have. No one has done anything better than this. I'm sorry, okay? No one. 
So Kevin is raising, but no one, okay? Believe me, no one, okay? Let me make it clear, like no one is still the best. Uh, and it was taken 10 years ago. Why? Well, because it was a good instrument. Uh, the IPC worked, uh, but perhaps because it didn't have the atmosphere, okay? So, I mean, it's not very impressive. That, that's what I tried to get into the a pot, the velocities, and they rejected it. I don't know, a bunch of idiots. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, I think it's beautiful, they should have selected it. Uh, this is the longitudinal magnetogram. That's the longitudinal fields, though this is positive polarity going out, negative polarity going into this. This, the Swedish tower has done, equally good. I've seen it and it looks the same, same amount of time. This is 30 minutes. Uh, and the Swedish tower has got something that is as good as this. I haven't seen it from any other place. Of course, the Swedish tower, the new Swedish tower with one meter and after MOM FBD, this multi-object, multi-frame blind deconvolution and with adaptive optics. But they didn't get this. Nobody got this. Uh, Kevin got something that looked like this, but it was so bad that he didn't believe it and he didn't publish. But this is much, much better. This is much better. So what is this? That's the transverse fields. Okay? This is the quiet sun transverse fields. And uh, this is what was discovered, not with Hinode, but with the advanced stocks polarimeter. That's what Bruce Lies called the horizontal internet world features. Uh, but it was with a slit, so we just saw them coming and going. But this is the first time we did a movie, an animation of this uh, horizontal internet world features. What are these? Tiny loops brought by granules. Some granules bring a magnetic field, a loop, so you are seeing the top here. And then actually all of them have opposite polarities on either side, if you compare with this. That's because it's a tiny loop of a granule. The question is why some granules bring some loops, but most of them don't bring any of these loops. Uh, but again, 10 to the minus 3, that's the sensitivity here. We really want to do this with 10 to the minus 4 and see if they are more frequent. I'm sure they, what they are. I'm sure they are. That's what Dickies can do, right? Uh, okay, so if you go to the paper that explains IMAX, you'll find these two tables. And I hope by now you know what many of the numbers are. I put the equations here just to repeat them. Uh, so, for example, there is a wavelength here. There is a spectral resolution of the fabry perot this is delta lambda, okay? This 65 milli is goes in here. 0 0.055 R seconds per pixel. That's this guy. That's the size of the pixel. And actually here is matching diffraction. So we were here matching diffraction. You need to do it, uh, but in here we did. Uh, because we were pushing for the diffraction limit of a one meter telescope. Uh, what else? Focal, that's not, uh, that's not important. The number of accumulations, is an A, we computed using this equation, we saw that you need to have six for reaching a signal to noise of 10 to the three, 800. That's at the core of the line and that's at the continuum. Okay, as I said, at the core of the line, you're gonna have lower. Uh, so the exposure time of a single image, which is the one that goes here, your detector, that's the exposure time we were using. Then because you accumulate longer, the total exposure time could be longer for getting whatever signal to noise you wanna get. Uh, and then in here, that's the detector. Uh, it says how fast you can go. You cannot go with this detector more than 30 frames per second, which is, by today's standard, not good. That, that's pretty old. That's 10 years old. And look at the quantum efficiency, 25%. It was a pretty bad detector, but it was the only one we could find that worked in vacuum. So that was commercial and working in vacuum, so we didn't have to care. IMAX was in vacuum when it was flying, so we didn't want to deal with air versus vacuum. So we decided to fly, it, even though the quantum efficiency was bad. Other things, well, the full well is important. That's how many electrons you can put before you saturate. If it gets too bright and you produce too many electrons for a given number of photons, you're going to saturate, and that's bad. <laughs> uh, so these are the numbers uh, that you can put in these equations. OK, uh, so with this, I'm going to now run the uh, Excel if my computer doesn't crash. And you're going to see, uh, uh -huh. OK. Well, so I think you have it available, uh, the Excel. Well, that shouldn't be a big download. The Excel is trivial. So that's what we created for us. So, what, what, so people have it or not? 
Well, eventually you'll have it, right? Or, we have it. Okay, you have it already. Okay, good. Uh, there are, there's a lot of information here. We use this for actual systems engineering of the, of, the, of the instrument. We were considering here observing modes, uh, properties of the atom. So it's the whole system integrated. All you need to care is about this photon flux and also this data, I'll show you this data part of the spreadsheet. But let's go to the photon flux. So what is what I have here? R seconds per pixel, this 0 0.055, okay? In here. That's already transferring into radiance. This is the 206265. Uh, and that's the diameter of the telescope. Is sunrise is one meter, it's 100 centimeters, okay? Over here. The wavelength, and I think this is with, uh, that's the 1.22, so it's there. <laughs> but because I don't like it, I also have the real cutoff, which is down there, right? So this is really where your MTF will go to zero. Uh, here there was a secondary, so I have a diameter of the secondary. Sunrise had was on axis, so I had to subtract it. Um, so this is the collecting area. That's your spectral resolution, frames per seconds of the detector. And for example, well, and in here, that's the detector. Here I could select two. I have a DALSA, the one we flew, but we had another one first that we try and we it never work. I think it's available here. You can, so you have a drop down menu there. You can select. PSL is a different one. First thing you'll see is that this one goes red. Red because it's saturated. Uh, so it tells you, hey, it's saturating, it's a bad idea. Why? Because actually this one was, quantum efficiency was pretty good. It was 90%. So the other one was 25, so the other one does not saturate. Uh, I mean, you want always the highest quantum efficiency, and then go fast, right, so that you don't saturate. That's what you want to do. Uh, and well, this, this is the 10 to the 3. You are targeting 10 to the 3. This, or 10 to the minus 3. 10 to the 3 signal to noise, 10 to the minus 3 if it is uh, sensitivity. That's the 10, which actually some people translate to Gauss, sensitivity in Gauss. Typically, 10 to the 3 in the visible is a few Gauss, it's 10 Gauss sensitivity. So that's the 10 to the 3. That's how many accumulations you're going to need and how long it's going to take. So in this case, and it's a coincidence, you need six accumulations, as you saw in the table, and it takes six seconds, even though the individual images are shorter. But let me just show two uses. So let's say, well, okay, I'm gonna go, that's sunrise, which is a meter, let's put Dickies. So I have to put 400 here, and of course you saturate, okay? Again, you have more photons per pixel, but that's because I haven't changed my pixel size to the new diffraction limit. If I do it, it's the same number, it won't saturate, is what I showed, okay? But here it's not linked. So I, do, I still have 0.055, right? If I put 0.055 and I divide it by four, I recover what I had before. And I already shown that, right? That if you target the diffraction limit, you don't get any benefit. So. If you are saturating with Dickies, what can you do? Uh, you don't want to saturate, it's saturating it 800% a lot. Uh, of course, it's uh, four squared. Well, one thing you can do always is go faster if the detector really lets you do it. And then it's supposed for a shorter period of time, right? So if I go here, whoops, I put, I put 10 frames per second, I'm going faster, still saturating, I'm gonna put 40, now I don't saturate. Uh, actually, this detector only had 30 frames per second, so it could not be run at 40. So there are all kinds of these technological issues that you have to deal with. You could not run it. And actually, it's 83% of saturation. That's bad. You don't want to be at 40. 40 is, uh, uh, sorry, at 83% saturation, because that's the mean. Uh, there are things that are brighter, so you're going to saturate the bright features. Okay? So you typically want this number to be 50. So you. 50% not better than that, so probably going to 50 or even 60. So if this detector would allow, I would say, okay, uh, we are going to now run at 60 frames per second. We have a Dickies, and what it took, six seconds, now it takes 0.3 seconds. That's the benefit of four meters, not targeting diffraction limit, okay? 0.3, targeting the same resolution, but you do it much faster. That's the benefit, okay? These are one of the trade-offs, and that's 
almost the last thing I want to show. Let me show you the last thing, and with this I'll be final finalized. Okay, let me put four here. That's what it was. Yes. Okay. This guy, ten to the three versus ten to the four. I mean, it really is is expensive. It goes with the square root if you think about it. So this is targeting ten to the three. What happens if I now with sunrise? I say okay, ten to the four. Put another zero. And this is six seconds. 632 seconds. Okay, so it takes forever. So you target 10 to the 4. That's how much you need uh, to sp spend measuring, adding how many accumulations, also 600. It's a coincidence, again, that these two numbers are identical. Um, so that's how expensive it is to reach this sensitivity. This factor 10 in sensitivity is not easy. But if you have Dickies, 400. You're still saturating, uh, and it's actually 35 seconds. So that, that's starting to look like something you can do, right? T reaching 10 to the 4 with Dickies. Actually, there's one more thing we need to get rid of the secondary. You know that? Of course, now we have more photons, so we're still even saturating more, uh, meaning that I need to go this one, uh, the 4 seconds, the four frames per second, sorry. Bump it up, perhaps to 50. And what is what we have here? 60, that's a good number. So we will have Dickies, 50 frames per second. The detector needs to go fast. But you're reaching the 10 to the 4 in still 35 seconds, OK? It's still 35 seconds, but you have 10 to the 4, OK? Uh, well, it's these equations that I've been showing. Okay, there's no more magic than that, and that's what is built in in here. But that tells you, you know, what it really takes to go to this 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, keeping the resolution, how long your detectors. So here it would be great to have the other one, not the DALSA, but have this one. I'm sure it's perfect. Uh, well, now it's saturating, so let's go faster. Let's go 100, and there are detectors that can go 100. Even faster, you would need here 200 frames per second. Wow, the case is 300, OK, 400. 400, yeah, a good number here. With a quantum efficiency of 90%, you take only 10 seconds. And you reach 10 to the 4. That's a beautiful number. I would love to do that, OK? Well, set of numbers, right? You see, they are linked. And they are kind of linear or square root. There's, there's no magic here. But that shows you, with just one Excel, how you can play around things and how you would do 10 to the 4 with the D keys. You need a fast detector. You need a good quantum efficiency. And it only takes 10 seconds. Do you remember what I said uh, at the beginning in my talk? I said, let's target 10 to the 4 with 0.1 seconds in 10 seconds. Actually, it's a coincidence. That's, that's it, right? 10 to the 4. 10 seconds and 0 0.05 r seconds per pixel, 0.1 r second resolution. That's exactly there. Dickies can do it. Well, you need the detector, right? So you have this, and I think you probably can play around and get a feeling. Then, you know, uh, well, okay, last thing uh, the transmission, right? And here you can play, this is IMAX, number of mirrors. Uh, you have four mirrors with 0.9. That's the cost of the, so that's the total transmission. So the, be, the, more, the higher the transmission, the better. And that's actually something we always need to keep in mind. Uh, it, there is always a cost for putting any optical element in terms of photons and in terms of wavefront error. The simplest you can be, the better. Uh, the total transmission of sunrise, that's the entire telescope, plus the instrument, is 4%. So the telescope and the instrument eat 96 photons out of 100, OK? 96 are wasted. You don't measure them. You only measure four, OK? So look how bad it is. This is what I was saying of the optics and all of that. So there is a price there, OK? And that's it. Yeah, right. Yes. Not in the core of a mind, right. So 
right. Yeah. Yeah, you always need to uh, keep that in mind. But as I said, in this photon counting, you know, you're off by only factor two. <laughs> it's not that bad. So the line versus the, the core of the line versus the continuum, well, sometimes it's a factor two, so that's a little more, but you know, it's kind of, you, you always need to know that, yes, your line will be deeper, you'll have fewer photons, uh, and it actually goes quadratic, so your signal to noise is gonna degrade in your, so yes. The reference, and that's the standard, doesn't need to be like this, is always signal to noise in the continuum. Yes. Yeah. Does everybody understand what Jana is saying? That's an important thing, right? Uh, the solar evolution. Uh, and just by solar evolution, uh, things are going to evolve. And if you, if you are exposing the number of accumulations for too long and things have, have evolved, it's not true that you have 0.1 hour second resolution. Because things have evolved. So, yeah, you have to take into account. And typically what people do there is, okay, if you really want to make sure, this is very, very, I, I never use this. Uh, if you really want to have 0 0.05, 0 0.1 seconds uh, resolution, this is 100 kilometers. So 100 kilometers, take the speed of sound. Don't let a sound wave pass through your pixel. It's six kilometers per second, and you should not expose for longer than that. That's such a huge price. <laughs> Nobody can afford that. So don't use the speed of sound. Use one, two kilometers per second. This is a more standard velocity of the sun. Six kilometers per second is terrible. Oh well, yes. Okay. That's, yeah, questions, if you have any questions. Yeah. Okay, which, let me, let me go back to the presentation. Going back to my presentation has dangers, but anyway. So, okay. Well, it makes sense because you, you know, well, let's go here. It is in here, okay? It is in here. Why? Because you get a bigger telescope. Make it bigger, okay? So that means uh, that this cone angle gets bigger. Right? Uh, and, and it means that the pixel that you're projecting, now there is the diffraction. You want to resolve the diffraction, which is not included in here, right? But these two cone angles are related. And because you're making this one bigger, and you want to have now diffraction, you need to make this smaller. So the diffraction, this is not in this. The diffraction will link this and this two. That's what this equation says. Yeah. So you're collecting more, but of a smaller area. So it compensates. Is this? So, that's, so in the equations before, this is the d omega prime, and that's the dA. Right? If you link them, this one you don't get that uh, that dependence. Transmission, yes. So that's, that's this tau over here, 0 0.04. Um, and that's typical of all instruments, even, yeah, 0 0.04. Right, but was why you didn't have AO, you were too... Well, it's even worse, yes. yes. <laughs> so that was one. So yes. How much is the transmission for this? 
Well, okay, that's built in into the IPCs. That's, uh, but they are putting some idea about you know, the elevation of the sun, and that goes with the air mass, and how much is the typical uh, absorption of the skies in Haleakala, and that will give you that factor. And then they have that many mirrors, they have that many lenses in, from Dickies, from the FIDO, <coughs> from the instrument, and all of this needs to be put in to the IPC. And I, I don't know, does anyone have, I don't have a number for any of the IPCs, or the, of the transmission of the instrument and the telescope. T, what I said is 4% for sunrise IMAX. Sunrise, yeah. Numbers for the of it's always a few percent. 10% is, it doesn't get any better than 10%. Yeah. Okay, I've never seen them. So it's only a few percent always. So that's how bad it is. <laughs> that you build a four meter telescope and you only measure four out of night, 100. The rest, you are eating them. Yeah? Yeah, I just, I mean, maybe, maybe now I'm going to leave me with your time to say here, but I think we should all be aware that we will have a slit spectrograph here, which maybe many of you are not used to. And for spectrograph, people who don't use the 10 to the minus 10 to the 3 is actually quite, quite good. So I would say that there, there, we will notice some improvement also on that side. That when you have many, many points to look at, you have, in a way, your signal to noise improves. Also, the oh, okay. resolution element is lower. You're looking yeah. at much more wavelengths than with the fabric off. Yeah. And that allows you to, for example, detect weaker magnetic fields. Yeah, it depends on, yes, could be, could be, right. Well, if, if you are sampling at the Nyquist frequency, it is what it is, and you are really trying to get uh, whatever spectral resolution, and then you don't get any benefit. But typically, uh, and I think that's the case with the spectrographs, we typically reach too good spectral resolution. I think some of these spectral resolutions that we sometimes target are extreme and not that important on the sun. Uh, there is a debate there, but it's better to do it with a beer, I think. <laughs> but yeah. Phil. Oh. And what does that mean? What are we talking about? Well, when, when you get to hear about the non-LTE part, if that source function that we talked about, which is the emission per mean free path, into a different mean free path, if that depends on the radiation all around it, and it's a bit like driving your car through a fog, instead of seeing a really sharp headlight, you see kind of a glow around it. Right? I, I'm wondering to what extent we're going to start to have to deal with that with DKIS based upon what I've seen on existing telescopes of one meter class. I would say we already see that yeah. in the difference between calcium and the G band and stuff. So don't expect just because the angular resolution is you know 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers of the instrument that the sun's going to let you actually see things at that resolution. You could have a little hot spot, like a headlight of a car, that's entirely smeared out by the fact that protons are having a hard time get out of the scattering. If it's pure LTE, you have no problem seeing it. If it's really the source function that's locally the temperature, you can see it. But similarly, it's scattering. Similarly, if you have a cloud in between you and the sun, you'll see all the structure in the cloud. It's only when the light is an integral of this radiation field plus the thermal source yeah. within the atmosphere that <laughs> so I think that's actually really important. You have a paper on that, I believe, right? You have a paper. Yeah, okay, <laughs> good. I haven't read it, so I won't read. Uh, well, no, no. I mean, let me tell you something that I think, you know, being my age, <laughs> I've seen it already. So Goran Shermer had a half a meter telescope, and he decided to have a one meter telescope. 
So he went from 200 kilometers to 100 kilometer resolution. And you still haven't hit that uh, photon mean free path. You are still approaching resolution of the photon mean free path. So he really got the benefit of reaching one meter. And the first time with the one meter telescope, the first time, first day, he pointed to the sun. He saw in the penumbras the penumbral dark cores. Before that, penumbras were a mess, were bright and dark, bright and dark, and nobody knew what they were. Now we know there is this fundamental structure, the penumbral dark cores, seen first because it's actually what is the size of this dark core? Is this the photon mean free path? Actually, we understand why it is the photon mean free path. It's a thermal, it's a convective and thermal problem, and it's going to be the photon mean free path. Uh, but he had the benefit of resolving for the first time 100 kilometers the photon mean free path. What you're saying is that benefit is not obvious for Dickies, and we don't know. And we'll see. I think what it will be is in the chromosphere. Yeah. Probably not in the photosphere. Probably not in the photosphere, in the dense photosphere. But the more scattering you have, probably will have some more uh, things that we haven't seen with a, a one meter uh, telescope. And I think, we're, I, I mean, I think really that Dickies is a telescope designed for the chromosphere. Yeah. That's where we're going to make real progress. And it's exciting because we don't, yeah. we don't know what Well, it's this layer that is yeah. terrible. That yeah, you're the guys that are figure some of this stuff out. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So I'm done. Yeah. Was the exercise clear? Do you want to spend another 10 minutes playing with it or no? Of course, it's, huh? it's clear. Yeah. It's all linear, it's all trivial. You can play with it, okay? And you can just keep in mind for Dickies, put 400 and take out the secondary. <laughs>